Welcome, everybody, back to The Root and Edified Show. I'm your host, Kat Elias, and we're here with your co-host, Manny Elias. And you're joining us for a very, very special episode today, a biblical view of the roles of men and women in the church. And to help us to understand that better, we have amazing guests today, Joe and Laura Slunaker. Hey. Hello. Happy dance for you guys. Before we introduce this amazing couple even more, I want to remind you of a few podcast reminders. This podcast is sponsored by and part of Beautifully Rooted, which is a Christian mental health and education corporation. And this show, The Rooted and Edified Show, is a fun-loving, no-facade, Bible-believing, conservative Christian worldview show for both men and women who want to hear the four T's, real-life testimonies, interesting topics, talents within the church, and also theology, of course. We want to help you grow deeper in your relationship with Christ and also more mature in your walk, with a few laughs on the side if we can get those. As a reminder, we put out both a video podcast and an audio one, so whichever your preference is, it's available to you. If you want to know more about our show or you want to help us out in some way and support us, feel free to check out our website, which is www.beautifullyrooted.com, and that is spelled B-E-Y-O-U. So now let's jump in and introduce to you even more, Joe and Laura, and we're so glad that you're joining us today, guys. Thank you so much. Yeah, Yeah. glad to be here. Thank you. Joe has his PhD in Old Testament. He teaches up through master's level at several institutions. He's also the interim lead teaching pastor at a local Southern California church. And Laura is a mechanical engineer and has worked for the U.S. Navy for almost six years. Laura and Joe have been married for nine months and love serving the local church together. So both of you guys, would you mind telling us a little bit more about yourselves? Sure. Like Kat said, I've been working for the Navy um, as a mechanical engineer for the last six years, which has really flown by. With that job, I've been able to travel to some really cool places and talk to some really interesting people like admirals and stuff like that. So now has it flown by or sailed by? (laughs) (laughs) Navy? (laughs) Sorry. Sorry. And then when it comes to serving the local church, I've really gotten involved in children's ministry Mm -hmm. at not. I work as like a substitute teacher for them. So whenever they don't have a teacher in that week, I go in and fill in for that spot. So it's been good. And Joe, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. My two great passions in life, besides my wife over here, (laughs) are serving the local church and uh, serving Jesus through the academy, through higher education institutions. I love teaching at universities. It's an incredible age when you've got a majority of students who are between 18 and 22 years old. And they are finally at the point in their education where they're not just memorizing content as you would in high school, but doing analysis and synthesis. And if I can just be frank, my secret weapon is I can make them read God's word for a grade. Yes. (laughs) And I tell you what, God's word is powerful. It does not come back void. And I see life transformation every single semester because people have to take the timeless truth completely serious. And so the two dovetails of my life, teaching at the university and then serving the local church, they go hand in hand. And as long as I get to do that for the rest of my time here on earth, I will do whatever the Lord calls me to. But if I get to do those two things, should the Lord will, I will just be a happy camper. All right. Do you want to tell us anything about the university that you teach mostly at? Sure. It's California Baptist University in Riverside, California. It's a large university, almost 13,000 students, 179 Mm. majors, minors, and concentration from engineering to nursing to theology to whatever you want. One of the things that makes us unique is it doesn't matter what you're studying, you've got to take at least three courses in my division. And I really feel like that is crucial because... We are creating engineers that know something about the glory of God. We're creating criminal justice scholars who can articulate that the Bible is true. We're creating people that are going into civil engineering or I need to pick something else other than engineering. People that are going into kinesiology or nursing that know that Jesus's command to love your neighbor is an all-encompassing command for the believer. And so to that end, I feel like it's in a very strategic place in the kingdom for making an impact in the real world. Before we get started on the biblical nitty gritty, I think a big congratulations is in order for both of you to newlyweds. So congratulations. Any special words for your bride over here? Love you, babe. (laughs) (laughs) If we can start off with a little bit about you two both personally before we jump in biblically, can you give us a little bit of background of your love of the study of the Bible? Yeah, I'll start. So I became a believer when I was 16 years old. Didn't really have any Christian experience before that. Didn't come from a Christian family. And so as a young man, the Bible was completely new to me. 
And if I can be honest, as I read it, it was questioning every one of the presuppositions that had been entrusted to me by the culture. And so I hit a huge culture shock between God's timeless truths and many of my assumptions and went through a radical transformation in those late teenage years as I came under the authority of God and realized that to serve the Lord and to obey his words is to bring my whole being under the subjection of his rule and reign. I'll admit that that was not an easy process. But at this point in my life, just looking back now on how God has brought me from there to now, I can say that the study of God's word has been the most influential thing in my life. I mean, being a part of the people of God, serving in pastoral ministry now for over a decade, his word is just a source of wisdom and life. And so it's a crucial part of my daily rhythm. Amen. And I think that's such an encouragement to all you parents of teenagers. Mm -hmm. There is hope with the word of God. Yes, there is. How about you, Laura? Can you give tell us a little bit about your background and study of the Bible and love of the Word? Sure. So I was very fortunate. I was raised by a family that kept me in the church and I was brought up in the faith and got to go even to like a private Christian school. So like the Word was a part of like every class and every day. And, you know, unfortunately, as a child, you do take some of those things for granted. So there was definitely some slips here and there, but God definitely had a way of bringing me back to Him and just growing my faith steadily throughout my childhood and adolescence. And then that all really accumulated in college is where I did the most growth, I think. We love that. We love to hear about families who are raising their children in the Word and what a blessing that is. Now, I imagine that there are many people who are hesitant to speak on the topic that we're going to be talking about today. We are thankful that you two are not. And we want to stand behind what is biblical. So we're glad that you're here. I imagine that there are many people who are even hesitant to listen about this topic. I think often they might be nervous to offend somebody or to be offended themselves. So maybe we can start off with a little preface of how we can handle topics in the Bible that potentially bring up lots of emotions and how we should prep ourselves and our minds to think biblically instead of subjectively. So I think that it takes a great deal of courage and boldness, but the buck stops with the clearly articulated Word of God. It is readily apparent that cultures around the world are different, whether in antiquity or in modernity. But the thing that doesn't change is God's Word. Amen. I mean, He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and His Word endures eternally. Whatever may change, whether our dispositions, what offends a culture or otherwise, our days are too short and our times are too evil to skimp the clearly articulated truth of God. And so I think that that's at least how I begin to approach this. And then secondarily, I think this is really important. I think it is the responsibility just of the responsible interpreter, first and foremost, what does the word actually say? You know, whether we agree with it or disagree with it is actually a secondary question. But if we are going to be responsible interpreters, first and foremost, we need to do exegesis. You know, that's a, a technical term that means getting meaning from the text instead of eisegesis, that is reading into a text. Mm -hmm. If we start off with an unbendable presupposition, chances are we're going to twist the scripture. What I would like to do is at least at first, whether or not we agree with each other in conclusions, let's get at what the Bible actually says. Great points. So now let's jump in and discuss the different biblical views of the roles of men and women in the church. Can you please tell us what are the main viewpoints of what the Bible says in relation to men and women in the church? There are two kind of mainstream perspectives, and this is, of course, an incredibly nuanced discussion. So these are in some ways going to be overly simplistic in their description. But you've got kind of two major ways of thinking about this. One of them is going to be egalitarianism, and the other is going to be complementarianism. Egalitarianism, as you can tell just from the language and the terminology, is the viewpoint that there is no distinction whatsoever in the function between men and women in the church. The other side of that coin is complementarianism, which once again, the language and the terminology, seeing men and women as complementary pieces that create a whole together. Kind of in the way that this works out then, 
In egalitarianism, the perspective is going to be that there is no distinction between what they can or should do. Complementarianism is going to say that there are specific roles that they can and should do, and that those roles, when done together, create the kind of structure that God intended. Do you think that there are certain groups within Christianity that tend to believe and agree with either complementarian view or the egalitarian view? I think so. And I think that, once again, this is a little overly simplistic, but it tends to be split along lines of whether people think progressively about culture, life, theology, politics, or otherwise, and whether people are traditionally more conservative, biblical, by the word. So what you're going to find in more progressive groups is an egalitarian bent, if not a full egalitarian perspective. Whereas those who maintain more, a more traditional conservative approach to the Bible are typically going to be more complementarian in their view. And part of the divide is that the Bible clearly makes the case that men and women are both created in the image of God, are both valuable, are both crucial to the people of God and to church, but have different and complementing functions. So a biblicist perspective is going to make the case that we've got complementary genders. Whereas if the ebb and flow of culture and modernity and more of what we see in our society is the benchmark for how we organize ourselves within the church, you're going to see more of an egalitarian perspective. Can you define modernity? So modernity would be more or less the modern period, like in contrast to antiquity. Right. And antiquity can mean so many different things. That could be 20 years ago in a technical sense, Mm -hmm. all the way up to two millennia ago. Modernity, we would consider like the present time we live in. Those are great points, Joe. Coming myself, having been starting as a egalitarian and then after reading scripture, delving into scripture, I had certain questions that just couldn't be answered in an egalitarian perspective when confronting the Bible. And like you said, between exegesis and eisegesis, one of the things that I think a lot of people do, besides just ideas, is when they bring their own emotions into scripture. And they impose their emotions on scripture and attribute that emotion to the scripture and say, God can't possibly mean this because it doesn't feel right. And I think that's one thing that As you read the Bible, in our previous podcast, we mentioned this, you're going to wrestle with these things. And ultimately, you have to decide, like you said, and I love what you said. Well, wait a minute. Is it me that that just doesn't like what the Bible says? And therefore, I'm saying it doesn't say this, trying to change it? Or does it really just say that? And it's just me that I simply just don't like it. And I have to confront that. Yeah, that's a great point. I'll admit, I'm a complementarian. But I want to give egalitarians a fair shot. Absolutely. Something that egalitarians will say is, well, if you see kind of a progressive redemptive hermeneutic between the Old and the New Testament, Mm -hmm. then you've got the framework for a progressive redemptive hermeneutic between the New Testament and the modern age. Absolutely. That is Uh, the argument they make, right? I think that that Mm -hmm. argument is faulty on several premises including the sense in which the New Testament makes the case that the gospel and thereby the gospel living expectations that are delivered to us through the New Testament are God's rule of faith for all ages. I mean, at several Mm -hmm. points, including in Jude, he's going to encourage the people that he's writing to to hold to the faith that has been delivered to you once and for all, which is different than everything you're going to find in the Old Testament that is setting up something in the future. Like it is so obvious that the Old Testament sacrificial system, that the Old Testament Levitical priesthood, that the Old Testament temple are all going to point forward to a greater reality, Sabbath even. And the New Testament explicates each of those in and of its own terms. Foreshadowing. Now, the New Testament does anticipate something. It's the return of Jesus Christ. Correct. But there's no change, really. I mean, Jesus is the king, though he's also the sacrifice, but he comes in the full scope of his kingship. So I think that the kind of progressive hermeneutic doesn't take into consideration the way that the New Testament theologians that wrote the New Testament under God's inspiration even handle their own message. And we've mentioned hermeneutics on here before, but maybe you want to define? The art and science of interpretation. And when applied to the scriptures, the art and science of biblical interpretation, hermeneutics. Okay, just so that I'm clear and for those that are listening are very clear, can you just summarize one more time? Those that believe in the egalitarian view, why is it that they believe that way? 
Yeah, one of the main interpretive moves that they make is they see a progression in theology between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that then kind of forms the basis of a presupposition that there's going to be a progression in theology between the New Testament and today. I see. I think that that perspective fails on a couple points. One of them being that the New Testament presents itself as the end all be all of truth. Like this is the gospel. Even the New Testament writers are going to use language like this is the gospel and this is kind of the Christ-like life that was delivered to you once for all. In contrast to the Old Testament systems, which were obviously set up to show us what was coming next. I also wanted to to mention and something we all obviously we refer to a lot on this program here is, you know, we understand that there are certain subjects and topics where even amongst brothers and sisters in Christ, we might disagree. I always like to extend a friendly gesture towards anybody who even holds a different view from me, even if I think that it's unbiblical. I love what Vernon McGee used to say, Vernon McGee through the Bible. He used to say, (laughs) you have the right to be wrong. And I love you in Christ, but you have the right to be wrong. We also, yeah, we also say that in marriage. Yeah, we also say that in marriage. You have the right yes. to be wrong. You have the right to be wrong. And I think for sure there is love there. And in all things, there is unity. And even if we expound on this particular subject, then somebody might be listening who thinks, oh, you know what? If you disagree with me on this, you must hate me. No, we do not. We love our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we definitely defend and we unite on the essentials. And anything that is non-essential, I think we definitely offer grace and have humility. in. But it's still something that... When you see something in the Word of God and you don't want to shun boldness and you want to make sure that everybody can still express that in a bold manner to defend the Word of God. My next question to you was going to be, do both positions, complementarian and egalitarianism, have biblical backing and where might we see that? I think you went over the egalitarian very well, and I think we understand that now. What about the complementarian view? Does that have biblical backing, and where might we find that? I think it does have biblical backing, and I think that you start in the beginning, in Genesis, in Genesis Mm -hmm. chapter 1. I like to say this to my church all the time. God creates so many marvelous things, incredible things, the stars and the mountains and things that we marvel at and go on vacation to see. And yet, from a biblical perspective, all of those are surpassed by the importance of humanity, because it's the only thing in creation that is created in Mm. God's image. And Moses is so careful in the way that he frames this. You've got two pictures in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. The one in Genesis 1 is of total equity. Men and women are created in God's image, period. And then in chapter 2, you get this honing in look on how they complement one another. Adam is sitting around He recognizes that he does not have a partner in the same way that he's seeing that in the animal kingdom. And that he has too many ribs. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Well, you know, there's this old proverb. It's, It's really cool. I don't know where it comes from, but it says that when God created Eve of Adam, he didn't use the bone out of his head so that she would be above him or the bone out of his foot that she would be beneath him. But he used the bone close to his heart so that she would always be close to his heart. But the important thing is that they complete each other. And by basic biology, when we get to Genesis 2, 23 through 25, which is Moses, the author, he's told us the story and now he gives us some theological interpretation. He says, therefore, a man will leave his father and mother and cling to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This is important for a couple of reasons. I mean, one, it shows from a sexual, from a biological perspective that they are meant to complement each other. I mean, the phrase one flesh, we may be uncomfortable with this, but it's worth mentioning. The phrase one flesh not only has a spiritual connotation, but a physical connotation that in the act of intercourse, they come together in a way that shows the image of God in an incredible way. Maybe, Maybe that's more explication on that is for another show. But from the very beginning, you see this compliment. And then mm-hmm. moving on from this point past the fall, you're going to see more and more of the way that they complement each other. Now let's hone in specifically on what seems to be a hot topic, women in the church and in leadership. Mm-hmm. And then we'll discuss the topic of men in leadership. We don't want to leave that out. And it is very important to start off with. Would you say that women have a role in the church and is it important? Absolutely. Women should be involved. They make excellent teachers and they can provide wisdom to both the younger women and women can sometimes be better with children. (laughs) Most of the time. 
Thank you. I, and I would just start to appeal to the incredible scriptural examples that we have, starting in the Gospels. I mean, the women that were around Jesus, Mary and Mary and Josanna and Susanna and the others, mm-hmm. they bankrolled Jesus's ministry. As we move on through the letters, we find Priscilla and Aquila, this Absolutely. dynamic teaching duo, husband yes, and wife. Yes. By the time we get to Ephesians, Paul is describing a church that meets in Lydia's house. Mm-hmm. And then in Romans 16, and there's some debate about this in translations, but you've got an individual named Phoebe, a demonstrably female Roman name, who's called a deaconess. That's I mean, correct. used with the language that's described there. And so from a biblical perspective, I think that it's just so clear that women have an incredible role and even an incredible role in certain leadership positions. Hmm. Um, I think that if we're supposed to take the Great Commission seriously, then that means that any believer, no matter where you come from, you've got a responsibility to make the, well, to go, to make disciples, to baptize in the name of the Father and of Son and of the Holy Spirit, and to teach people to observe all that Jesus has commanded. Mm-hmm. Now, I think we need to get into the nuts and bolts of what that looks like and the whole scope, because one of the ways we get off track in this conversation is not taking a whole Bible perspective. So if we only take one particular verse and try to apply it just with broad strokes, that leads to some of the confusion. But just as a general introduction, women are crucial in the life of the church. Amen. We thank you for that acknowledgement, right, Laura? (laughs) And if I can just say from my personal experience, you know, I'm sitting here with two incredible women where y'all serve at the same church, seeing the way that they use their gifts and talents, the way that they lead in all kinds of different ways, I just think is good for the kingdom of God. So I get to see this on a weekly basis. Amen. I get to see it on a daily. <laughs> Thanks for that. We appreciate that. So just to be clear, can a woman be a pastor in a church or are there instances in which it is permissible? I think that this is where the conversation goes, where it required our preface at the very beginning. Because from a biblical perspective, I don't think that it is permissible for women to be pastors. I think that that is a role that God has assigned to men, not for the sake of, I mean, let's just clarify what we don't mean here. Not for the sake of domineering, not for the sake of dominance, not for the sake of arbitrary authoritarian leadership, but this is something that God has designed to show a larger spiritual reality similar to marriage. In a marriage, Paul describes this in, first, in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, that you've got these individuals that come together in covenant and that the husband plays the Christ figure and the wife plays the church figure mm-hmm. in the sense that they sacrifice for one another, love one another, and by their care for one another, they show the world the gospel. Another layer of that in the way that we operate within the kingdom of God is in pastoral ministry. One of the reasons why God has assigned to men this responsibility is to show a greater spiritual reality. Great points, Jim. Great points. And, you know, I wanted to bring up a particular verse that I think even as I as I was growing in my spiritual walk with Christ and my knowledge of the word of God, there was a very special woman who was like my godmother in church. And she was the first person to really teach me scripture. And it reminds me so much of Paul reminding Timothy of his grandmother and mother who taught him scripture. And I, I love that. You know, she taught me scripture. And yet I remember as I continued to delve into the word of God and to learn the word of God, there was always an issue that we wrestled with when we did have fellowship. And it was that particular issue. I think she felt sometimes that she was ostracized for not being able to do certain things in the church that she thought women should also be able to do. And I remember the more I studied scripture and the more I learned, we were able to have these difficult conversations, yet, you know, necessary to have. And one of the things that I, that I remember that they would make a case for an argument for, and I think it would be a, a misinterpretation of that particular scripture, but I wanted to share it really quick to see if you could probably give us some insight into it. Do you mind? Sure. Please. Right. And so it's in the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verses 27 through 28. It reads, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And I think a lot of people, when they would read that, and she even brought this particular scripture up, See, we're all one in Christ. And one of the things that I obviously emphasized to her was when you converted, did you stop being Salvadorian? She's like, no, she's still Salvadorian. I'm, I'm still Mexican. I still love Mexican food and I still love mariachi. But something happened and impacted my culture, the gospel, 
that filtered everything that I learned from my culture, but I did not cease to be Mexican. In the same way, when I became a Christian, I did not cease to be a male. So what is Paul talking about when he says there is neither Greek nor Jew, nor male or female? I think that if you look at the greater context of Galatians, which is an incredibly powerful book, it's like the the message of Romans mm -hmm. condensed down into Amen. a third of its Amen. size and has served as such an incredible theological powerhouse over the years. The great German reformer, Martin Luther, mm. famously, this was his famous book. And this is weird to me, but he was so affectionate to it that he would mm. call his wife Galatians <laughs> and his wife Katie, he'd call it like, this is his Katie. Very strange, <laughs> right? Like, talk, talk about a Bible nerd to make yeah. us feel all a little uncomfortable. <laughs> want... But the heart of Galatians is about salvation. And so the whole of chapter three is making the case that we are not saved by works of the law. We are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. And in the latter part of this chapter, he is making the case that there is no human barrier for a person to come to faith. So men are no more deserving of salvation or undeserving of salvation than women are. And that goes along with the other two pairs he puts in there. Jews are no more Amen. Amen. deserving or undeserving of salvation. Greeks, slave, free. There is no human construct that puts a barrier in between us and Jesus because Jesus came to be a sacrifice for all. And so the context of that makes it very clear that this chapter is not talking about what you do within the church. It's talking before that, mm, what point. Jesus has done for great us. Point. And he breaks through those walls and says, come to me. Amen. I love what one preacher once said. He said, a text taken out of context leads to a pretext. Right. You know, <laughs> I think one of the things that when someone misinterprets its passage, it leads to a lot of tension. Right. And their walk with Christ, because then they begin to put anyone who, who disagrees with women being pastors and stuff like that, as if they're against women. So that's not the case at all. Correct. And moving back to Galatians 3, if you think about the other places that this author and others do talk about distinction, you know, this author is going to say, are all apostles? No. Good, good point. James is going to say, are all teachers? No. Mm, I mean, th and, and there's a division in, even in that respect, right? I mean, Jesus makes it clear in the Great Commission that we're all teachers in a sense. But there's also a sense in which there's this formal responsibility that's entrusted by God to shepherds. Once again, just trying to read in whole Bible context, I think, clarifies the issue. Now, there's a thought that I've heard of a lot more recently, and it may have been out there for a long time before, but what I've heard of a lot more recently is that women pastors are needed, or, the, or it's permissible because men in leadership are weak. What would you say to that? So I think that, number one, I'm sympathetic to the emotion behind the argument. Mm. And I think that the kind of biblical justification of that primarily comes from judges in the sense that you've got a female judge and she's kind of, you know, a partner with Barak who is more or less a weak figure in, you know, that particular narrative. But I mean, there's no Old Testament prescription against women being judges, by the way. I think that the logic of that argument kind of fails because if we were to apply it to other scenarios, it would probably make us uncomfortable. I mean, our giving at church is weak, so we should steal. That doesn't seem to be a logical syllogism. And so in that respect, there is a problem. And if there's a problem with weak or ungodly leadership, that's a significant problem. But I don't think that you fix a problem with a non-biblical solution. Great point. Any thoughts, Laura? Oh, I think that's like 100% correct, yeah. Is it biblically permissible for women to be able to teach men in some other capacity or some other facet other than being a preacher? I think in a bunch of different ways. I can speak specifically about learning from my wife all the time. Mm -hmm. And I would say this to her face or behind her back, <laughs> but she's got an incredible servant heart. And so I learn about mercy and about grace because I need those things from her on a daily basis. When Jesus tells us to appeal once more to the Great Commission, to teach people to observe everything that Jesus has commanded, I think that there's a verbal aspect of that, but there's also a demonstrative aspect of that. And I see Laura live out Jesus all the time. When I observe that visually, that helps me to observe Jesus's commands bodily. 
So I think that we learn in a whole variety of different ways like that. Furthermore, in the context of a church specifically, I think about the incredible lessons that I learn from the women in our church all the time. And I'll let, let me tell you just a, a quick anecdote. I've made a huge problem. We've got an incredible woman who is in charge of some administration and planning. And I didn't even consider her when I made a plan for the church. Mm. It was just total my bullheaded forgetfulness. And I totally went around her and did something, totally just leaving her out of the equation. And so she asked for a meeting with me and we sat down. And one of the things we say at our church is real talk before small talk. And I really appreciate that because not pulling any punches, she said, hey, I'm the one who's supposed to be doing this. You've thrown a wrench in the machinery. You've double booked the schedule. We've now got a problem. And I learned a lot because as brother and sister, we were able to get to the bottom of what was going on. And I was able to repent. I was able to affirm her. She affirmed me. There's no love lost between us, but it was an incredible learning experience. Mm. And furthermore, I think just in community, once again, I appeal to the book of Acts, Priscilla and Aquila. They find a guy who's teaching and he's passionate, but he doesn't really Almost. know the full gospel. Mm -hmm. And so together, and, and Luke, the author, is explicit about this. Together, they teach him the more correct way. Absolutely. And Apollos goes on to be an incredible evangelist Amen. as a result Amen. of that. So th there are incredible opportunities to teach. And also, Joe, one of the things that I definitely experience on a daily basis, you know, with my wife, especially, you know, <laughs> that the Lord, whom the Lord chooses to use as his chisel to okay. shape my life. And I think that one of the things that I definitely am so grateful to God for is my wife. To be honest with you, like you just said, she's been a great teacher in my life. Yeah. A great teacher. You've been a wonderful teacher in my life. Mm -hmm. I think that with regards to learning how to deal with my kids, um, sometimes I get angry. Sometimes, you know, and I'm like, man, that was such a short feud. I need to learn to tame that. And my wife is a great reminder of that. And the Lord has used her to shed so much light into that part of my life. Well, I've learned a lot from you. The Lord has used, utilized you mightily in my life. Now, Laura, I don't know about you, but for me, something that encourages me is the fact that Timothy's grandmother and mother taught him. It reminds me when I'm thinking about the children that there's a powerful impact that can be had and just how those women move so mightily in his life that he was able to do what he did. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That was kind of like my grandma for me. Like mm -hmm. she made a huge impact in my life. I would not be where I am today without her. And she taught me all about prayer and how that needs to be the first thing you do in any situation, whether it be in sorrow or in rejoice. That's kind of something that I've always kept in my mind as I teach the children, like this is something that they could know. And maybe 20 years from now, that's what they'll lean on to. So that's amazing. That's amazing. Kat, I hadn't thought about it until right now, but just piecing our way through church history. There is seldom an influential male figure that does not attribute their mm. spiritual development wow. to an incredibly wise and godly woman in his life. Yep. I'm Under thinking of <laughs> Augustine. Oh, wow. Uh, yes. You know, to go back Beautiful. to the church fathers. I'm thinking about Billy Graham to go to the modern period. You know, and, and those John are two Wesley. poles. Awesome. John Wesley, John Stott, for that matter. There's a consistent history there. Mm. Great points, guys. Great points. What wonderful Paul errors we have in Christ. From a female perspective, in relation to what we're discussing, Lord, is there anything that comes up in you that comes into conflict because of the complementary view? Honestly, that's made my life a lot easier to have someone that compliments me. Like, I, I couldn't ask for a better husband, honestly, than Joe. He makes up in what I lack, and then he has the leadership skills that I don't necessarily have and the ability to make decisions and think further ahead or whatever plans that may come. And to lead an engineer for the U.S. Navy. No simple feat, but a good one. Now, in regards to the topic of men and leadership, doesn't sound so like such a hot topic, but actually when we talk about good mm. leadership, I think it is Absolutely. and what you do when it's poor leadership, but we'll get into that. Would you say that men have a role in the church and is it important? Absolutely. <laughs> they have their places in the church, you know, as the body of Christ. What did our friend say that the body of Christ and he's like the small toe? <laughs> <laughs> Men? Once again, I think sometimes that the conversation gets derailed because when we talk about leadership in the church, sometimes people substitute the word leadership with 
dominance. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that we get a biblical perspective of that at all. I mean, Jesus himself says that the first will be last and the last will be first. And Jesus, God in the flesh, Mm. humbled himself to the point of death on the cross. And in, in a pragmatic sense, right? I mean, takes off his regular garments, puts on the clothes of a servant, gets down on his hands and knees and washes his disciples' feet. Mm -hmm. That's what godly men do. It's not about dominance. It's about servant leadership and it's about character. And I think that maybe when we frame the, the conversation in such a way, we can keep it from going off to the far poles. You know, men are going to be the, the dominant force and, and, and women have no role here. That's not what we're saying. What we are saying is that godly men care for the people that are around them and choose to sacrifice and serve those because that's what Jesus demonstrated for us. Thank you for that. What would be some of the qualifications in addition to that service attitude of men in the, leader, in the church? In 1 Timothy 3, Paul gives this whole list of pastoral qualifications, but they're really not pastoral qualifications. These are Christian qualifications Mm. that those who prove themselves in this respect can be considered for pastoral ministry. And just going down the list, I mean, you've got people who are meek, power under control. You've got people that are humble. You've got people that are decisive in leadership. Able to teach is the only thing in that entire list that has to do with function. Mm -hmm. Everything else is a character issue. And unfortunately, and maybe this is not so unique about our culture, but we definitely live in a culture where we follow dynamic personalities. That's never listed in the Bible of what it means to be a godly man. Instead, what it means to be a godly man and by extension a godly leader is a character that demonstrates Christ a willingness to serve the people around you, a seriousness in your faith, not getting drunk with wine. I mean, all of these character and choice issues that show that I am committed to Jesus, not myself. Those are the kind of qualifications that a Christian man aspires to. What should the church do when they find a male leader, pastor, who's not living up to these qualifications? I think that's one of the difficulties that women have sometimes when they think about not having women pastors is saying, well, the men are weak and that doesn't get disciplined. That doesn't get addressed. Mm -hmm. So they must kind of step in or they feel that their issues are, are highlighted so much more than men's issues. What should happen when male pastors aren't living up to those expectations? Well, first off, Kent, I think that in any place where men are given a pass for sin and women Mm. are not is an unhealthy place. That's not a biblical place. I think the major word here is accountability. Accountability is thoroughly biblical. Rebuke is thoroughly biblical. And throughout the New Testament documents, you find that again and again and again. And no one is above it. Even Peter, who in certain places is called the quote-unquote super apostle. We know of his misgivings in the Gospels where he denies Jesus, and yet Jesus is so merciful, right? Well, what about later? Let's get back to the book of Galatians. Paul cites an episode in his life where Peter's being a hypocrite. In chapter 3, he had just said there is neither slave nor free, nor Jew nor Greek, nor male nor female, right? And yet Peter, as an apostle, is prioritizing Jews over Greeks. Correct. That's not right. That's not what a godly man does. That's not what an apostle does. That's not what a church leader does. Paul confronts him to his face. Mm -hmm. Mark Dever's written a book. It's called Nine Marks of a Healthy Church. And one of those nine marks is church discipline. Mm. That sounds a little scary, Uh maybe a little Uh regressive. And yet, I think we might just rephrase it as accountability. If we put leaders of any kind up on a pedestal where they cannot be knocked down, where they've got no one speaking into their life, what do we think is going to happen? Someone who is not held to a biblical standard will not live a biblical standard. That's why nothing is meant to be done in isolation. In fact, this is an interesting tidbit. The biblical words that are used for pastors, there, there are three major ones in the old and in the New Testament, I should say. When they are used of the concept of leadership in the New Testament, they are never used in the singular even once. Mm. There is a New Testament assumption that there will be a plurality of, of leaders. They're called shepherds. We've already got a great shepherd, yep. a senior shepherd, and that's mm-hmm. Jesus. Everyone else who is serving as a shepherd or pastor of a church 
is one of many who serve under the head and serve with their brothers. I think it is crucial in the case of accountability, and I'm, I'm going to be bold here, to remove bad leaders, to call sin, sin, to not sweep it under the rug, and to strive towards holiness together. We are imperfect people. And as I read 1 Timothy 3, I see at many places where on a bad day, I've made a mistake. Mm -hmm. It is amazing to have brothers and sisters in the church that hold me accountable and that call me back to this list. Any other thoughts from the male perspective of what we're discussing? Yes, absolutely. I think um, I, Joe has, has definitely laid out the case, a biblical case. Many times, I think, especially when someone converts to Christ and they're a new Christian, a new believer, you want to honor Christ in everything that you do. You want to separate yourself from any unfortunate image of what males are, interpreted as in several cultures. Like, for example, I come from a you know, Latino culture where a lot of times the grandfather was a womanizer. And sometimes the, the women had to just put up with it, you know, because that's what men do. You know, that's what they would say. There's this image, unfortunately, and that's what I think has led to so much extremism and feminism, you know, where there's just such a, a hatred for that male figure sometimes in society that they try to completely steer away from that. One of the things that I remember when I converted is I wanted to honor Christ in everything that I do. And I remember God gradually transforming my image from what was perceived to be a male in my culture to the male according to Christ. And I remember that feeling so free. I'm like, no, my culture is not, is, is not what is going to construct my image as a man. It's going to be the word of God and only the word of God. And one of the things that I learned as I continue to read the Word of God is how he held women in utmost respect, where I had never seen that, to be honest with you, in other males until I saw it in Christ. The more one reads the Word of God, that's what changes you. That's what transforms you. And a lot of times I think the, the error in a lot of progressive Christianity is that they sometimes forego the essential Word of God. And begin to impose so many different ideas and say, well, it's, it's progressive and God manifests himself in different ways in different cultures. I'm like, um, no, the, the scripture is clear. The scripture is his word. And the ultimate authority in the church is the word of God. But I think in a lot of progressive Christianity, they begin to impose a lot of cultural views. The gospel is a filter for culture, not a destroyer of culture. When it enters a culture, it doesn't destroy and eliminate the culture. It filters sin out. So that now that culture can glorify God. I want people to know for sure that anyone who truly loves Christ and respects and loves his word should demonstrate humility and love for his wife and respect for all females. Last question that I have for you is, does any of the discussion regarding the roles of men and women in the church have any impact or reflect upon the roles of men and women in marriages, family, the home, maybe workplace? How does that impact the other aspects of their life? I think that I would start by appealing back to Ephesians chapter 5. As Paul describes all these different life scenarios, one of which is marriage, he prefaces that conversation by saying that believers submit to each other out of reverence for Christ. Mm -hmm. And then he goes into the family dynamic. And the family dynamic, once again, is meant to point to a greater spiritual reality. And that greater spiritual re reality is the gospel. I, I saw this firsthand in Ethiopia. I was mm. working with missionaries out there, two married couples, all four of them were nurses. You know, because of some of the cultural constraints of Ethiopia, when people would come to the medical clinic, the women would go with the two wives and the men would go with the two husbands. And I mean, this is a really unfortunate reality, but one of their primary clientele was battered wives. It, it was hard to see. And what was even more tragic is they would speak about it so casually. You know, how did you get black eyes and a broken nose? Well, my husband, husband didn't like what I made for dinner last night. Wow. Just heart-wrenching, right? It is. But, but here's what God was doing in the midst of the pain. Eventually, you know, the women that were coming to the clinic would see the way that the missionary couples interacted. And mm -hmm. they would say, hey, why does your husband treat you so well? Nah, it's, mm -hmm. just, it's just because you're Americans, you're Westerners. They'd say, no, absolutely not. Our husbands treat us well because we're Christians. Mm, Our husbands God. love and honor us Amen. because we follow Jesus. Ethiopian women were coming to know the Lord mm. as 
the result of just seeing what Christian husbands and wives should be doing anyway. I mean, you've got these simple acts of love and service and devotion and honor that are showing this world Jesus's relationship with his church. And I think that when it comes to family headship, when it comes to headship in the church, you know, we've been saying that God has designated pastoral leadership for men. Once again, looking with a whole Bible perspective, I don't think that that means that women withdraw from the world. I mean, women are crucial to the world. I I am so happy to be married to an incredible productive leader. Laura is the head of her department, and I love to hear the stories of that. She, Laura really kind of demonstrates Proverbs 31 woman. Uh, that, that text is so incredible. I'll let Laura begin that explanation of what it means to be a Proverbs 31 woman. Before we got married, I did an in-depth study into wow. this because I thought it was really important going into marriage, what it looked like from a godly perspective and biblical perspective. And so in Proverbs 31, it's 10 through 31. It says, a wife of noble character who can find. She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships, bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still dark. She provides food for her family and portions for her servant girls. She considers a field and buys it out of her earnings. She plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for they all clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them, and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity, and she can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, as he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the reward she has earned and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. I love that. So maybe like Martin Luther and him calling his wife Galatia, you can start calling us Proverb 31 or yeah. something like that. This text is incredible. Uh, ironically, in its original context, this is not written to women. The book of Proverbs, just kind of in holistic context, is written from the vantage point of a father to his sons. Correct. D- don't misunderstand me. I think that everybody needs to read this, women and men. But I have seen so many women's studies on this text. Men need to study mm, this. Amen. I, so I see Laura in this. And here's like a, you know, I, I got a uh, Old Testament PhD. So here's a little kind of Hebrew tidbit for you. This passage from 10 to 31 is a chiasm. That is a textual construction whereby you've got this intentional like cascading structure. It forms an arrow. Think of it as an arrow. And if it's an arrow, that means the top and bottom of the arrow are the same approximate point. So what this text is doing is it's repeating these points, beginning and end. And if you track through, it's not identical words, but it's the same concept, A, B, C, D, E. And the important thing about a chiasm is whatever point is not repeated, that's actually the center of the text. That's the main point. The center of this is verse 23. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. Here's the point. This woman is so godly. She's such an incredible leader. She's a provider even. She's a hard worker. She's intelligent and she's diligent. She is so amazing that the elders think more about her husband because of his association with her. That's the kind of woman a godly man looks for. So any other thoughts, Laura, since you study this so much on this particular passage of things to maybe keep in mind that we maybe see examples from this text? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really important for us as women to know that we can go out and work and provide for our family as well. And we definitely respect stay-at-home moms who work very hard and that women are also able to have another aspect to their lives of working and be respected as well. So now we'll jump into our scripture section of this episode. And do you have a particular scripture that you wanted to point out that pertains to what we discussed today? 
Yeah, the scripture we brought up was Proverbs 31, and Laura explained it great. And for me, 1 Corinthians 11, 11 to 12, which is, Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made for man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. So to me, that's just a reminder that men and women are both valuable in the Lord. Manny, did you have any scriptures that you wanted to bring today? I did. I kind of brought a curveball. Um, <laughs> surprise, surprise. Yeah. I think, you know, it's one that I wrestled with a lot when I was going through the transition of holding a, an egalitarian view and, and trying to do that because I thought that it would be something that would please not just my godmother, but other women in the church. And I thought, well, that's the fair thing. You know, I was reasoning from an emotional perspective. And I wanted to do that because I thought it was the right thing. But the more I wrestled with the Word of God, there were certain passages that would just confront that assumption. And I want to read this passage, and maybe Joe can um, give us some insight into this passage as well. But it says, um, 1 Timothy 2, verses 8 through 15, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing. If they continue in faith, and love, and holiness with self-control. We've got a couple things going on here, and curveball indeed, right? This is the hardest, uh, particularly it verse is, 15, is, is the uh, the hardest text probably to translate just from a lexical point right. of view, but also, I mean, it really kind of grates against our sensibilities. Yes. So we've got a couple things here. Verses 8 through 10 is making the case to both men and women that our lives are not our own. Mm. That we belong to Jesus Christ. And that is a crucial component of following Jesus. We live in an identity-obsessed culture. Mm. Amen. Um, and there are parts of our identity that are beautiful, incredible. But getting back in some ways to Galatians, you know, Paul made the case that our worldly identities are no barrier for Jesus who went to the cross for us. Mm. And he's going to say in another letter, when it comes to his responsibility to minister, he's going to say, I became all things to all men so that by any means necessary, I might save some. Speaking, of course, about sharing the gospel and Jesus saving them. For Paul, he's got a sacrificial identity because it's from the world because his real identity is in Christ. At several points in the New Testament, we have real deal issues where our inspired biblical authors say that maybe our freedom to do something is limited by our responsibility to serve other people for Christ's sake. Mm. And so we've got this description of modesty and holiness and religious practice that makes the case for both men and women that we are not our own, we are owned mm. by Christ. Next, 11 through 14. He's really kind of dealing with a particular issue in Timothy's experience, but giving us a timeless truth as well. And he's appealing to the fact that God has ordained men for pastoral leadership. Mm -hmm. That leads us to verse 15. He then says, yet she will be saved through childbearing, which seems to grate against mm -hmm. so many things that Jesus said and that Paul has written elsewhere. We've got to take the context into perspective. For, right. For one, to make his case, right, that men are supposed to be pastors and that we've got some really disruptive females that are trying to clamor for that top spot. And, you know, Paul is tell telling Timothy, hey, Timothy, you've got to reorient these people around God's order, around the gospel. He then appeals to something that doesn't change, and that is the truth of the scriptures and the truth of what happened in Genesis 3. He's still talking, I think, about Adam and Eve when he gets into verse 15. So if we take 14 and 15 together, or let's just go 13 for context. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. That's like the first part of chapter three. The next part of chapter three is that Adam and Eve suffer consequences for that rebellion. Mm. But immediately after that, God shows grace. And in Genesis 3.15, God makes a promise to Eve that's actually looking forward to Jesus. 
He says of Eve's seed, her offspring, singular, someday, that the serpent will bruise the seed's heel, but that the seed will crush the head of the serpent. Mm. When we're talking about childbearing, in the context of Adam and Eve, it's taking us right back to Genesis 3. Paul is not saying that women are saved by works, by the work of childbearing, but he is appealing to the incredibly crucial responsibility that women have played in all of salvation history. I wish you would have told me that before I gave birth to so many kids. <laughs> <laughs> He's saying two things here. Number one, that women are crucial in this responsibility. Number two, that it is through Eve and then by extension, Mary, that the Savior would come. That self, it's not that, sh that a woman will be saved by childbearing, but through the bearing of a child, Jesus Christ, we might be saved. Amen. This particular passage, I remember wrestling with it so much when I first converted, and especially because... I didn't like at that time what it said. I wrestled with it. And to be honest with you guys, I asked so many, even other brothers that are theologians and said, hey, you know, but I could never get a good explanation from an egalitarian perspective on it. And I'm like, the point is, though, regardless of how I feel about it, what does Paul say? And to me, ultimately, I love what you mentioned about his appeal, because normally in scripture, a lot of the writers of the New Testament, the evangelists, the, the authors of the gospel would always say and quote the scripture. And say, you know, from the law of Moses or as the prophets say. But there's a couple of occasions where both the Lord Jesus and the Apostle Paul do not appeal to the law of Moses nor to the prophets to make a very clear statement and to establish a truth. Referring to God's creation, God's order. And here I love that the Apostle Paul, being a great student of Gamaliel and now of the Lord Jesus and knowing the Old Testament so well, the Bible at his time, in his time, right? The Bible so well does not appeal to Moses or the prophets here, but says, for Adam was formed first, then he. He's appealing to the divine order in creation, right? This is the way God instituted it. This is not instituted by man. So when I finally came to grasp that reality and that understanding, I'm like, Lord, this is the way you instituted it. Forgive so be me it. if I'm trying to change that. So be it. And so be it. That's it. And then I learned later in life, you know, the more I studied the scripture, there's a lot of other parts in scripture that are difficult to understand. And what do I do with it? A great guideline that I learned from one of my, my favorite theologians was R.C. Sproul. In his book on hermeneutics, he says, you know, sometimes you encounter difficult parts in scripture. And one of the guidelines that will help you in your interpretation is that whatever is clear in scripture, whatever is explicit in scripture, always has priority over whatever is implicit. So if you ever find anything that even if you're confused or you don't fully understand it, it implies something, always submit it to what is clear in Scripture. And thank God that the most important parts of Scripture are clear. The most important doctrines in Scripture are clear. Now, as we conclude, was is there one takeaway that you guys would like for everybody to hear of just, if there is one thing you're remembering today, I want you to go home with this. That men and women complement each other and that we all have our own separate roles. And But through those separate roles, we can come together and make a perfectly functioning body and one another. You, mm -hmm. How about you, Joe? I would piggyback on that really profound truth. Men and women are equally created in the image of God for different responsibilities. And the incredible mystery of our union is that when men and women come together in unity, doing what God has designed them to do, they show something about the completeness of the image of God that they don't do separately. Hence, the significance of that covenant together. Love that. Thank you so much, Joe and Laura, for coming on the show today. We really appreciate it. And we're so glad that you came on today. And thank you to all that are watching this video podcast or listening to our audio podcast. We appreciate you being with us. If you enjoyed today's episode and you got benefit from it, you want to hear more, feel free to give us a subscribe, a like, a follow. That will help encourage us to keep on going. That will help us to know that you liked it. And feel free to share our material with your family and friends. Don't forget that you can find us on most of your major podcast platforms. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram and on YouTube. Again, thank you so much for coming on today. Would you mind closing us out in prayer? Sure. Thank you. thank you. Okay. God, we thank you so much for this time that we got to have together discussing about what men and women's roles are in the church, God, and that we were able to have like open communication, God. And um, I ask, Lord, that we would bring you glory and honor in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, everybody. Well, we'll talk to you next time. Ciao. Bye. Bye.